All right, Esther chapter 4, a uh, very exciting passage. I think it's a very encouraging passage. We're going to jump right in to this, starting in verse number 1. The Bible reads, When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and bitter cry. So obviously we're picking up in the middle of the story. If you remember from last week, this is when wicked Haman uh, went to King Ahasuerus and asked if he could have all the Jews killed. Basically, it stemmed from Mordecai not bowing down before Haman and just and, and not, uh, you know, not reverencing him as the law said that he needed to do was to bow down and, and do reverence unto Haman. He wouldn't do it. So that, that gets Haman really angry, really irritated. And then he finds out that he's not doing it because he's a Jew. And it kind of brings it, it, it broadens his scope of hatred against all the Jews, against all the people of God, to the point to where he just wants all of them to be exterminated. He wants to kill all of the Jews. So this is now where we pick up in chapter number four. And he sends out this, this proclamation. He sends a post out all over the kingdom, everywhere the king has authority, which is essentially the whole known world there. So it's, it's this whole uh, uh, huge kingdom. And this is where we pick up in chapter 4 with Mordecai being really upset about this, understandably so, right? That now there's this, you know, basically this command is just brought forth that, that him and all of his people are going are gonna, to, you know, lose their lives, right? Or that at least people are going to be on the attack against them. So what Mordecai does is says he rends his clothes, which he, you know, he kind of tears his clothes. You see this all throughout the Bible when people get, you know, really upset, really grieved, lots of mourning, they'll, they'll kind of, they'll tear their clothes, they put on sackcloth with ashes. And what they're doing is they're humbling themselves, right? So they're, they're just putting on this, this, this cloth garment of just, you know, not fancy at all, the most low level thing you can put over yourself essentially to cover yourself and, you know, ashes and just, just, you know, the ashes is just to, again, make yourself as low like the dirt, like real lowly and humble because the point of all of that grieving, sackcloth, ashes is to entreat the Lord and really make sure that you are not lifted up in pride at all because you've got some serious requests to make known unto the Lord. And says he went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and a bitter cry. So he's, you know, he's just yelling out and, um, and just really upset. Again, you could understand why this is such a big deal. Uh, verse number two says, And came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. Now, the king, there's a lot of weird rules that you find out, and we're going to see another one here later on where Esther can't even approach the king, even though she's his wife. But they have all these, these weird rules, and one of them here is now, I'm just going to speculate on this just, just for a brief moment. Not going to spend very much time at all. But the fact that it mentions here that none might even enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth, you know, one possibility could just be, well, he's got a dress code because he's a king and he wants people dressed up a certain way to meet with him. But I think what's probably a little bit more likely with, with this king in particular, remember, he was the party king. And he wants everyone to have a good time and everyone just have fun and everything. And, and what I think is that, because it specifically mentions sackcloth, he probably just doesn't want people grieving around him. He probably doesn't want to have any downers, right? People just mourning or anyone upset because everyone should just be happy all the time. I'm the king and everything's great. So you're not allowed to come in by my, anywhere near my presence or anywhere in the palace here with a, you know, if you're mourning, right? Just, I don't want to have anything to do with you. And that's probably the way... You know, it, it kind of fits with, with, his, uh, with his attitude here in, in the pattern that we see. Obviously, it's not a huge amount that we get to see in these chapters. But um, anyhow, that's what I think. Those are some of the thoughts going through my head. You know, if you don't agree with me, I don't care. <laughs> it's fine. Let's keep reading here. Verse number three. Verse number three says, And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Now, I have a part of my sermon at the very end of the sermon where I'm going to go more in depth into fasting, but it's all dependent on how much time we have because. That's just kind of a, a side note to everything that's going on here. There's a lot greater issues to, that I want to cover 
So we'll get into that a little bit later and refer to just, just the power behind the fasting and, and everything. But obviously this is a big deal. Verse number four says, so Esther's maids and her chamberlains came and told it her. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved and she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. And, and one of the things that we see in this entire chapter and what it kind of focuses around is this communication between Esther and Mordecai. And Mordecai here is the solid Christian. He's the one strong in faith. He's the one that's, that's you know, completely sold out to serve the Lord. He doesn't care what's going to happen if he doesn't bow down and serve Mordecai. He's just going to stand on the word of God. And that's totally who he represents here. This is part of who Mordecai is. He was a great man of God here, willing to make these stands. And as we see his communication with Esther, he's right in all the advice that he's giving her. And Esther is the, is the, you know, the picture of someone who's just a watered down, weak Christian. And we need to learn from this. Because right? we don't want to be the watered down, weak Christian. And what you'll notice, and you've probably already experienced this in your own life, is that you know, even amongst other believers, amongst other people who are saved, oftentimes when conflict arises, when there's some kind of persecution or turmoil or some kind of you know, offense that's going on, what they want to do is just kind of brush you under the rug, not worry about it. Oh, oh, you're in sackcloth and Here, just put these clothes on. You're making a big scene. You know, don't, don't, don't cause any attention. We don't want any drama. We don't want anything like that. You know, that's kind of the attitude of many people who just, you know, they, get, they may be getting offended easily because they're not as strong in the faith. But it's something that happens and something we see happen all the time. And obviously, for people who are younger in their faith and, and you know, spiritually younger, we want to help them grow. And it's part of growth to, to not really always just be so steadfast and strong in your faith, but you don't want to stay there, right? And we also need to call it out and say, no, you know, you're acting like a spiritual child when you're not willing to stand and stand strong in the Word of God. And you need to grow up. And there's a lot of Christians out there that need to grow up and stop. Actually, you know, what, what you're doing is what you end up doing without even probably intending to is discouraging those who are making the stand, discouraging those who are trying to stand on the word of God by trying to get them to stop doing what they're doing. Because this is what Esther was trying to get them to stop. Like it, it's a, the, the sackcloth and ashes is a public expression. And he goes, he wasn't allowed inside the king's gate. He's going right up to the gate. He's going right up to that point to be seen, right? To know, hey, this is a big deal. I'm in sackcloth and ashes and we're weeping and wailing and crying out and making sure people understand what's going on. That God's people are under attack and this is a big deal and it's not something you're just going to sit by and take quietly and just you know, allow yourself to be um, carted off to the slaughterhouse. Right? Something needs to be done. Something needs to be said. It's not just going to be uh, you're just going to be taking it quietly. But oftentimes the weak Christians, they want to avoid call conflict at all costs and just, oh, no, no, here, put this on. And oftentimes it's the weak Christian that's going to you know, condemn you for making a stand. It, the weak Christian would, would be, and this didn't happen in this story, like we don't see the evidence of this happening, but it's the same type of thing where they would say, oh, well, why didn't you just bow down? I mean, we're all bowing down to Haman. Now look what you did. See, you didn't bow down. Now he's going after all of us. Way to go, Mordecai. huh? Now, look, we don't stand with Mordecai. He's an extremist. He's crazy. You know, hey, if the king says to bow down to Haman, we're just going to bow down to Haman. That's what the weak Christian thinks. That's what the weak Christian's going to do. And they're going to blame actually the bold man of God who's saying, no, I'm standing on the, the, the word of the Lord. I'm not going to just succumb to this. I'm not going to just bow down to anybody or anything just because some man says to do it. I'm going to obey God rather than man. He ought to be exalted. He ought to be lifted up. He ought to be looked to as a hero of the faith. And instead the weak Christian is going to point him out as being, oh, he's the troublemaker. It's exactly what the children of Israel did to Moses. I mean, they were slaves. They're in bondage, right? And Moses is, is he must feel all, by, all alone. God sent him Aaron to go help him out. And they're going before Pharaoh. Saying, hey, let my people go. 
right? They're, they're trying to bring redemption. They're trying to bring freedom to the people, to the children of Israel. And what happens in the short term is that Pharaoh starts making, you know, starts persecuting and making their jobs harder. And then the people get all upset at Moses, at Aaron. Oh man, you know, at least we, you know, we used to be able to get our job done. Now they're just trying to make it much harder. What are you doing this for? It's like we're trying to free you. I'm doing what God said to do. And ultimately that should answer, that should end all questions. Well, why do you got to do that? Well, why do you got to preach against the Sodomites? Why do you got, you know, the weak Christians are going to say, why do you got to do that? Now you're going to bring all this negative attention on Christian, and you're going you're gonna to push people away from the faith. Yeah, Mordecai was really pushing people away because he wouldn't bow down to wicked Haman, satanic, devilish Haman. Oh, but no, yeah, now you look what you did. You brought, look, he didn't bring that, that destruction on people. He didn't bring a threat on people. Wicked Haman is the one who's bringing the threat against people. Don't put the, the you know, it's the same stupid mentality that people say, oh, well, if you don't vote for Trump, then you voted for Biden or you voted for Hillary. It's like, look, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. No, it's not the same thing at all. You don't vote for this person, then you vote for that person. Well, I didn't vote for any of them. Amen. So then who did I vote for? Well, by not voting, that means you voted for... It's like, you're stupid. And weak. The weak Christian is going to just make up all these excuses and end up going after the, strong, you know, the, the person who's strong in their faith. Don't be that person. Okay, if you're too weak to make the stand yourself, then you know, that's between you and God, but don't go and then try to Try to stop or, or discourage the person who is making the stand. If you're not going to show support, then don't show anything. But don't go then reviling and talking bad about the guy who is standing up there. Oh, yeah, well, they're extreme. Well, they're crazy. They're, you know, show some support Amen. for the person who does have a backbone or grow a backbone yourself. Get founded in your faith. So Esther, at this point, she just wants, she's like sending him clothing, like cover yourself up, man. Don't let anyone see that you're, you know, you're in sackcloth and ashes. You shouldn't be doing that. I mean, the king doesn't want people in sackcloth and ashes, but you know, no, there's a time for this. This is the, the right, appropriate time to be doing this. You know, and on the other hand too, the, this, this, uh, clothing yourself in, in sackcloth and ashes and, and having such a big deal, you also want to just be doing that all the time. Right? Like the boy who cries wolf. The best example I could think of in, in, in our world and, and, and what people here could probably relate to is, is the, it's the Alex Jones type. Everything's red alert. Everything's the end of the world. Everything's just the worst thing. And oh man, everything's going to go. If you don't do this right now, everything's going to die. You know, like, look. We don't want to do that because you're going to lose any credibility for the really big deals. If Mordecai just every, well, there's Mordecai again, dressed in sackcloth and ashes. There you, there he is, just, he's on, he's on his hobby horse about something again. I don't know what it is, but it's just the worst thing ever. No, you know, it, <laughs> these events happen, you know, they shouldn't be happening very often, but when they do, when it's really important, you know, you just, you got to do it and you got to make that stand. And he's making that stand here. So verse number five, uh, the Bible says, Then called Esther for Hatak, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he had appointed to attend upon her, and gave him a commandment to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So before she even knew like, why he's so upset, she's just saying, oh, no, you know, put this stuff on. And then you know, she finally realizes after he refuses and says, you know, like, no, then she decides to ask. And you know what? That's another folly of a lot of weak Christians as well. The folly is the weak Christian is going to see the news article, yeah, the little clip, the little soundbite from the people who hate God anyways, from the lying so-called journalists that want to sell their story, and then they're going to come out, oh man, this person's crazy and everything else. 
Why don't you bother to do a little bit of research and look for yourself? Why don't you decide to just actually listen to what's being taught or what's being preached or what's being said and then decide if it's actually coming from the Word of God or if someone else is just taking some soundbite and trying to hype it up because they know that people are going to get all upset about it and, and make a judgment, a righteous judgment on, on the actual cause. There was a cause for Mordecai to be in the condition he was. There was a cause for Mordecai to be in sackcloth and ashes. Esther didn't even bother to ask and find out, hey, why are you in sackcloth and ashes? Because then once she does that, she realizes, she, you know, after this point, she's not continuing to say, well, just put some clothes on anyway. Because now she realizes, no, there's actually a cause, there's a purpose. Right? It's, it's really important. But then it turns to, well, now you have to do something. Let's keep reading. Verse number six, the Bible says, So Hatak went forth to Mordecai unto the street of the city, which is before the king's gate. And Mordecai told him of all that had happened unto him and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasuries for the Jews to destroy them. And that just shows you, we saw this in the last chapter, but it shows you how, how dedicated Haman was to exterminating God's people was by promising to pay the king, like, hey, you let me do this and I'm going to give you all this money. Now we saw that the king said, you know, take whatever money you need, you know, to get this stuff done. But, but that's, this is how dedicated he was, which he brings up this point. He's promising to pay in order to destroy the Jews. That's a lot of blinding wrath and anger. Now you might be able to say, oh yeah, but he wanted to receive the spoil from, from killing him. I don't think that's really what was motivating him here. And we're, we'll see that a little bit later too. We get into further chapters, just the anger and wrath and hatred just, just burning inside of, of Haman. But let's continue on here. So this is, he, he explains, you know, what's going on, what, what, why he's so upset. Verse number eight, also he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them. So he actually gives them an evidence too, saying, look, I'm not just making this up. Like, here you go. Here's the facts. He's backing up his claims, which, by the way, is what we ought to be able to do, too. You're going to make a big deal about something, you make a big thing about something, you know, back it up. Have the facts. Have the evidence and be like, here it is. This isn't just, you don't want to go off half-cocked. You don't want to go off not knowing the whole story. You want to know, look, look, I saw it for myself. I'm not just listening to gossip and rumors. Here it is. Here's a copy of the decree that was sent out and signed with a stamp and seal of King Ahasuerus. It says, also he gave him the copy of the writing, verse 8, of the decree that was given to Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther and to declare it unto her and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make request before him for her people. So now he gives her the writing, he gives her the decree and says, you know what? When he says it charges her, he's giving her a command or an order saying, look, now you need to go into the king and, and, and treat him. You know, plead for us, plead for your people. You're in a position now. You have the king's ear. Go in and try to make sense of this and talk to him. And, you know, she was the one. You remember, she was the one that was chosen out of all these other virgins that were brought in, you know, from the land to be his wife. And he chose her. If anyone has influence, you know what? Esther should have that influence. Verse number nine says, And Hatak came and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Again, Esther spake unto Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these 30 days. And, you know, I don't want to get too far off on that, on that rabbit trail. I mentioned this before. It's kind of a weird marriage. Like, you haven't been called into the presence of your husband for the past 30 days. That's kind of weird in and of itself. But we know he had all these concubines and everything else. So in, in light of that, obviously the whole situation is weird, but um, it just seems kind of strange. But it's also strange that it's, you know, it's his own wife. And she just has no access to be able to go and see him. But there is that caveat here. I mean, and that's, and that's, how serious is that too? Like you just come into the king's presence and like you're just gonna be put to death unless he gives you a pardon on the spot. 
Like that's a pretty crazy, I mean, can you imagine that like in, in, in any modern government now? Well, if you just enter the presence of this king, you're going to die unless he called you there or unless he gives you a, an on-the-spot pardon. That's kind of bizarre, but that's also, I mean, talk about someone being lifted up and to have that type of a law or rule think so highly of yourself that no one can disturb you or come into your presence unless you call them and it, the, the penalty is death. I mean, it's one thing to say, okay, I'm a busy guy. I've got a lot of things going on. You know, you don't come into my presence unless I call you. That, that makes sense, but having that a capital crime is just bizarre. So what we see here, though, and, and you know, she's, she's explaining this back. She's sending this message back. And I can't help but wonder, why didn't she go and talk to Mordecai? Probably because he was dressed in sackcloth and ashes. Maybe she just didn't want to be too closely associated, so they're using this back and forth. Now, we know why Mordecai couldn't go into her, because he couldn't go into the gate. Because that was a law, so he, and, and it's not like he's going to stop mourning and being in sackcloth and ashes, so he can't go in on her. Previously, he was going in all the way up onto like, where her chambers are and stuff to be able to communicate with her every day, see how she was doing, and check on her. But now he's not able to do that. Why didn't she come out to him? Maybe there's another reason, but again, I, I, it seems strange that she just keeps on going back and forth. And again, I think it's still just another sign of her being a weak Christian and not wanting to be associated now with someone who's making such a big stink and a big deal and, and you know, garnering attention by putting himself in the sackcloth and ashes. But what she's been charged to do here is something that's very difficult for her, right? I mean, obviously, there's this law that says, well, I, you know, I, I might potentially lose my life. And I'm pretty sure that Mordecai was already aware of the possible consequences when he wrote that unto, unto Esther. I don't think he was ignorant of that law, but she feels like she has to remind him anyways, which is ultimately just exposing her fear. And, and there's too many people, there's too many people these days, when it comes to doing what's right, when it comes to standing on the word of God, they won't even consider actually making that stand to be an option because of possible bad outcomes. It's damaging. You want to know why we're in the condition we are today? It's because too many people haven't opened up their mouth at the right time. Too many people haven't made the right stand for truth and righteousness and the Word of God and they kept their mouths shut and they went along and things continue to get worse and worse and worse until we're at the point we are now. Now people don't want to say anything because they're worried about losing their jobs. Yeah. Now, I mean, it's so crazy with the censorship now and the cancel culture that we live in that, I mean, tons of people are fearful of saying anything, even, you know, whether it be political or religious or anything, because there's, there's, there's so much wickedness abounding and there's so many wicked bullies out there that are in positions of power that are having people fired, that are getting people, you know, giving them a, a lot of troubles in their life. But you know what? It wouldn't have happened if enough people would have just been bold enough to make the stands when necessary. Because what you need to do is you need to make that stand because it's not about you. You can't worry about just your own, you know, some potential bad outcome when it comes to doing what's right. What's right is right all the time. Amen. If more people weren't afraid of losing their jobs, I mean, they're not going to fire anyone, everyone, and if they did, then there's going to be more people looking for work. <laughs> I mean, they have to switch jobs and go somewhere else. And here's the other thing, though. We're st you're still not alone. There's tons of people out there that believe, but they, they're too afraid to say anything. They're too afraid to do anything, but they're not going to have as much of a problem with someone who does stand and you know what by making the stand you can embolden other people to make a stand also I would be doing my children a disservice our church a disservice and God a disservice 
if I didn't make the stands that I've made that have made me lose my job and the statements and, and other things that have come up, everybody would be ill affected. You say, well, how can you be doing your children a disservice? Wouldn't you be, you know, backing down or, or not making those stands to, to help them? No, because in the end, it's not going to help them. Because when they grow up, their world's going to be that much worse by me not making the stand. And this is for all of us. And this is, this is, and this is the most extreme example in the story of Esther is, hey, you need to make this stand. You're in a position where you can make a difference. You're in a position. And, and you know what? Regardless of the position you have, what's right is right. The Bible says to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. You know that you need to do something that's right. You know what's right and you just close your mouth and do nothing. That is a sin. Sin. We need to always do what's right. We need, but you know what? This is where the faith comes in. This is where the faith comes in. Because you can see, oh man, I mean, if I go into the king, I'm going to be put to death. Well, how about you trust in God? How about you do what's right because God said to do it? And then rely on him to be your defender and rely on him to be your protector. Rely on him to be your shield. Trust in him. But I don't know how that could possibly work. You don't have to know. Just do what he told you to do. It's amazing what you could go through and the evil you can escape when you just trust in God. It's amazing. And guess what? The Bible's full of stories of people who have done just that. Read Hebrews chapter 11. Talks a lot about people who had a lot of faith. And you know what? Those are the people being honored and recognized too. Do you want to be a good Christian? Do you want to be a great Christian? It's real simple. Just do what God says. But that also means do what God says even when you're afraid. Even when there may be consequences. Even when there may be consequences, you don't want to face that. I don't want to deal with that. You do it anyways. Because that's where the faith comes in. That's where the faithful people then are not only recognizing God's eyes, but also you're going to do so much more help to others. And, you know, you may think that, well, my situation is just real little and only affects me. No, it doesn't. I don't care what your situation is. It's never going to affect just you. Never is. When you have an opportunity to stand on the word of God, it's never going to affect just you. you. Say, well, if I back down, no one else is going to know. It will. They'll know. Someone will know. Your kids will know. Your friends will know. Some coworker will know. Your boss will know. Whoever. Someone else is going to know. And it's going to have a bad impact overall by doing that. And, as we mentioned already, it's sin. Let's keep reading here in, uh, in Esther chapter 4. So, Mordecai is telling Esther, you know what? You need to go and, and confront the king and tell him about this. And she's responding, going, well, I don't want to be put to death, essentially. He's got this commandment. So, verse 12 says, and they told to Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to Esther, think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. So he's putting it all in perspective for her and say, you know, I know you're afraid of, of losing your life, but what makes you think that when a decree has gone forth and all the Jews are being killed, that you're going to escape? You think that you're going to be the only one left alone and everyone else is going to be put to death and they're going to spare you? You better think again, sister. And, he, and he, he goes further. He says in verse 14, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, he's saying if you, if you just keep quiet about this and you don't do anything about this, he says, Then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. Mordecai is confident and has faith in the Lord, knowing that, you know what? God will deliver us. God will save us. And you're the one that can do it. And you know what? If you don't do it, Someone else will. God will save us no matter what. God will make sure that this goes. Mordecai is a faithful Christian. He is a faithful man. He's a faithful man of God. He knows it's going to happen. He has confidence and, and rightfully so. But you know what else he adds to that then? He says, you know what? If you keep quiet, 
God's going to deliver us. I know that. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. Saying, you know what? If you turn your back on God now, if you don't take this opportunity to, to have the chance to be the one used as a deliverer of the people of God, then your house is going to be destroyed. Because the burden is on you to do it. If you forsake that burden, God will find someone else to, to fill the spot. But you know what? You're going to be destroyed. And I love this last phrase. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Who knows? Maybe, Esther, maybe the entire reason why you've gotten to this point in your life is for this time right now. It's for you to go into the king and save God's people. Maybe that is the entire purpose as to why everything has happened in your life the way it's happened up until now. Maybe that's the reason. And you know, there's a lot of things that happen in people's lives and you don't understand. A lot of bad things happen. A lot of tragedies happen. Esther lost her parents, right? Her parents died. Well, why? I don't know. Right? Bad things happen to people. It's unfortunate. It's sad. Well, Mordecai adopted her and raised her. Right? And she had this. And then all of a sudden she's growing up. Well, now the king's commanding all these people to go in, these virgins, to be one of his concubines and pick one out of a thousand or ten thousand or whatever, you know, to be his wife. And now I have to go there? Well, why... That's not what I wanted to do. That's not who I want. I don't even love the guy. I don't want to marry him. But she's put in this position, right? She's in this situation. And look, things happen in, in life that go against what we want. And, so, and for some people, it's worse than others. And we don't understand it. And people question God. Go, what? Why? Why? And you don't know. Why, God? Why do you allow this to happen, God? And some people get bitter against God. So I don't even think God exists because how could God let, you know, let me go through all this, this suffering and go through all this pain? And why, you know, why, you know what? You may not know why now, but you may know why later on. It may become evident later on. Because every person, God has assigned a minister by whom they believe. And there's different people in different positions and, and will have different influences because of what they've been through, because of their history, because they've gotten to the point where they're at. And Joseph was a perfect example of that. Joseph, great guy, serving his father. He was, he was being the shepherd. He was out watching over his dad's flock and, 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 you know, doing what he was supposed to be doing and being a good son and being a good child and doing everything right. You know, his brethren hated him, right? And they wanted to kill him. Instead of killing him, they threw him in the ditch. They sold him into slavery. He goes, he goes off to, to be a slave and then he's wrongfully accused and convicted and cast into prison, right? And all these bad things happen. He's living his life and he could do the same thing and say, why? Why is all this happening to me? I'm just doing what's right. I'm just trying to do what's right. I'm just trying to do everything the way I'm supposed to be doing it, God. Why is this happening to me? And then before you know it, he gets lifted up. He's exalted. He becomes the, the number two in charge in Egypt, just next to Pharaoh, and is able to save the people from sure destruction, from the famine, because God used him and used him mightily. But you know what? He didn't know that's where he was going to end up until way, 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 way later in the story way, way later down the road in his life. He was a young man when he was, when he was, you know, sold off into bondage. Bad things happen to people. And you know what? Who knows what happened? And the Bible doesn't recount every bad thing that happened to him, but you know, who knows this type of abuse he might have faced being in bondage? I don't know. But you could still be used of God. And we need to maintain that faithful attitude as you go through life and as bad things happen and as you don't understand why things are happening in your life, you know what? Maybe there will be a greater purpose someday. But here's the other thing. 
don't blow your chances and your opportunity, especially in areas where only you might be able to make that difference. Yeah. I mean, Esther, yeah. through all these different circumstances, has made it to this, this position where she can talk to the king. And what greater purpose could there be than saving your own people from being annihilated? I mean, if you're waiting for something bigger to come along before you, you know, take that leap of faith and say, well, I just got to say something, there's nothing else that's going to come along greater than that, right? But I say, let's not wait. Take that leap of faith anytime it comes across your path. Because who knows whether or not God might have put you there for that reason. And you can apply this on so many levels. How about an opportunity to preach the gospel to somebody? How many seemingly random interactions do you have with people? People doing service work, people coming out to your house, coming out to your work, coming out to different areas, and lo and behold, whatever, however the circumstances just seem to set themselves up, you're left alone talking to someone and you're not necessarily on a, on a timetable. They're not necessarily on a timetable. You've got this time to be able to talk and you don't give them the gospel. You don't even bring it up. You don't even see, is this person, you don't even ask the question. Right? How do you know? Maybe, maybe God set that up in that person's life and in your life that you could be that minister by whom they believe. Don't let, those, don't let those opportunities pass you by. It could, have, it could have been for such a time as this, that you've been led here, that they've been led there. Sometimes it seems more obvious, like when we go out soul winning, we talk to someone, they say, you know what, I was just praying last night. I was just praying this morning. I've been asking, I've been wanting God to show me a sign, to, to, to bring me to the right church, to show me the truth. I want to go to heaven, you know. Time and time again, I know for a fact, I, I mean, of course I know for a fact, I've talked to people, and I've talked to other people that have had the similar experiences to mine where you talk to these people and it's like, yeah, God's involved there. And I just so happen to be this servant being used to, to answer this person's prayer by being sent to them to give them the truth, to show them the gospel, to show them how to be saved. And sometimes they blow it. I mean, maybe we're brought here for such a time as this. But we want to make sure that we're not the ones that blow it. Don't, don't blow those opportunities. Don't let them pass you by. Or maybe something even more similar to this, you know, when, when confronted with the decision. There's always a crossroads. You're always going to cut, you know, there's points in your life that you're going to look back on. And usually when they happen, you're going to start to feel like this is kind of important. What should I do here? Yeah. And you really need to be prayerful and rely on your faith and take a step back. And here's the thing. When fear gets involved, it makes it harder for you to make decisions. Decisions made for yourself are always seem to be harder than decisions made for other people. So one of the best ways to think about your own decision-making process and what you should do in a situation is think about what you would counsel someone else to do in that same exact situation. Remove yourself from it and think about someone else. If someone came to you and said, hey, my boss wants me to do this, or this is what, you know, what would you do? What should I do? And, and then whatever you would tell that person, what's going to come to your mind for them, apply that to you. Well, but mine's a little different. No. Look. Don't wiggle out of what's right. Because you're going to regret it later. And, and, and the, the, the bigger of a deal it is, the worse the consequences are going to be. And that's what Mordecai was explaining to Esther. Like, look, I mean, this is a big deal. If you, if you back out on this, you and your father's house are going to be destroyed. I mean, God's going to save the people, but you know what? You're going to be destroyed for this. Who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? 
Don't ever forget that in your life when you go through different things. You don't know. And he's, he's not saying that it's 100% it's for sure, but he's saying, who knows? Maybe this is exactly why you're here. Because it is a biblical concept that God can direct our paths. And especially when you're living righteously and doing what's right, God will direct your paths. And you're listening to him. And you know what? You've got to walk by faith and not by sight and understand that I'm letting God direct my path. So if this is the path that, I'm, that, that he's leading me on, then I'm just going to keep going and not back down. Especially because you're afraid. Afraid of family, afraid of friends, afraid of losing your job, afraid of, you know, losing your life. And losing your life. I, I've never had to face that threat. I can't imagine what it's like. I don't know. But it's a, it's a, it's a much weightier matter to consider than, you know, losing your job. But you know what? That doesn't change doing what's right. Doesn't change it. Doesn't change it. We do what's right because we're trusting in the Lord. And if God said to do what's right, then we're going to do what's right. And if God wants us to continue doing what's right and keep us around, then He's going to have to. He's going to have to figure out a way that we can keep doing what's right. How about Daniel in the lion's den? How about that story? Government made it illegal to pray to anyone unless you go to the king first. What did Daniel do? He kept praying the way that he always did because he doesn't have to go and seek man first and have some other mediator between God and man other than Jesus Christ. So he continues to pray. Yeah, but, the, but he's, he's going to be you know, thrown into, a, into a, you know, being put to death and thrown into lions then. He's going to do it anyways. And you know what? That faith in God is what saved him. And, I mean... Think of all the ramifications of that one event. If he would have just said, well, God will understand. I'll write my petition to pray so that way I'm not going to break any of the king's laws. And, and No. If he, if he did that and folded and buckled, how much worse would those wicked men who were just trying to attack that man of God anyways... What else are they going to do? We know that the, that the children of the devil are, are implacable and unmerciful, and they're going to keep on furthering and furthering and furthering. So you think you're backing down. Oh, well, dude, we'll just let him have this right now. No, they're going to keep pushing farther and farther and farther and make it worse and worse and worse. And to the point where your resistance isn't going to mean much of anything anyways. But at that point, it's like the tides had turned because these people were after him, after him, after him, and then all of a sudden, you know, God delivers them, and then what does the king do? He turns it around on the children of the devil, and they end up getting cast into that same lion's den, and they get destroyed, and they get devoured, and they fell into their own snare and into their own trap. And it was recompensed unto them. But Daniel had to stay strong and not faint and not back down and not get scared. All throughout the scripture, you find the examples. This is just one more. And don't think, who am I? I'm a nobody. Esther could have said the same thing. Who am I? What's my background? My parents were dead. I'm adopted. I don't, you know, who am I? You're someone that in the right position can have huge influence and huge power and do great things for God. And that's all of you here today. Because it's not about who you are. It's not. It's not about who Esther is. It's not about who Daniel is. It's not about who Moses is. It's about who God is. And anyone who's willing to yield themselves to, for that purpose. To, to demonstrate and to show that. And we need to have it settled in our hearts. That we're going to do right no matter what. Look at verse number 15. The Bible says, Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go. Gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast ye for me. And neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. 
So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Mordecai did a really good job of instructing, charging, and convincing Esther to grow a little bit spiritually. She needed that encouragement. She needed that support. She wasn't as far along as she needed to be, but you know what? Mordecai helped her. Did he coddle her? No. He told her the truth. He also didn't turn his back on her either. He didn't say, well, forget you, but he, he told her what she needed to hear. Shows how much he loved her. And this is, you know, this is why I love the IFB churches that love people enough to tell them what they need to hear. People that need to grow, people that need to learn more, people that need to, to continue on their path. Look, you're not enemies. If you're enemies, then we wouldn't, then, then you know, the person preaching isn't going to teach you all the things you need to know. He's not saying this is easy. I know that what the king's commandment is. I know you might be put to death. But this is what's right, and you might have been brought to this purpose, you know, this time and place for this purpose. And she finally says, you know what? I'm going to go. If I die, I die. If I perish, I perish. She's going to do it. And we need to get to that point in our life where we can just have that mindset of, I'm going to do what's right, and if I perish, I perish. And she asks him here, and then verse 17 says, So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. So he's saying, yeah, that's reasonable. Of course, we'll, we'll fast for you. We'll support you. We'll pray for you. And he convinces her to go and do it. And, and this is a serious fast, too. And, and when you study the Bible, and I'm not going to get too much too far into this. I'm, I'm going to let it go. I'm not going to preach another hour sermon tonight. But the Bible, you know, when she says fast for me, and you look at the fast in the Bible, there's, time, there's a couple times where like Moses and Jesus fasted, you know, for 30 days and 30 nights. This fast, now Jesus, I don't think that he was necessarily without water because it says that, that, that when he was done fasting, he was hungry, right? And, and if you go without food and water, the first thing you're going to be is thirsty and then you're going to be hungry because you need, you need water more than you need food. And you need water more, more quickly, right? You could go without food for a long time. And some of us could go without food for a really long time because we've got extra reserves. <laughs> but you can only go without water for so long, right? So, um, you know, when Jesus fasted in the desert for 30 days, he, uh, I, he probably had some water during that fast. And uh, Moses was probably without food and water, but he was sustained by God for that length of time. But even just, I mean, going three days without drinking water, that's a long time. This is a serious fast, and it's a big deal. And throughout the Bible, you know, if you're, if you're a lot of people, a lot of Christians have the question on fasting. Um, it's really not complicated at all. You, you could look back at the examples of people who have, who have fasted throughout Scripture. Uh, you see David fasted for his newborn son after he had committed adultery. And, you know, fasting that God would change his mind, that he'd repent, that, that, that he would spare the child's life. Of course, he didn't, but that was the purpose. It was a big deal, right? He decided, like, I'm going to fast and pray and humble myself and, and, and get on my knees and get on my face before God and beg for mercy. Uh, Jehoshaphat fasted also for a battle. It was a great battle. They're outnumbered. So he's going to proclaim a fast and, and, and uh, you know, not eat and not drink. And also the city of Nineveh fasted too. When Jonah came in and he preached, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And they believed the word of God. They're like, man, you know, what are we going to do? Let's proclaim a fast. Let's tell God we're really sorry. We're going to mourn and weep over this and, and, and just humble ourselves. And all of those examples are very significant problems, right? Very big deal that they, they, they turn to the, you know, this fasting and, and humbling themselves. And it's just as appropriate today as it was then uh, to do a fast. Now, there's all different kinds of fasts. And again, I don't want to get, I'm already starting to get into details. You could go back and listen. I preach sermons on fasting. Go, go find them online where I've gone way in depth on uh, the subject matter of, of fasting and, and 
dealing with that because there's there's a, there's kind of a lot to it, but it's it's still overall it's really it's not complicated at all either. Um, but the takeaways from Esther chapter four is don't be a weak Christian. Be strong in your faith. Be settled to have the attitude of if I perish, I perish. Because I'm going to do what's right. And you know, God needs more people to have integrity and to not just be a bunch of hypocrites saying you believe things and not actually following through with it. And he needs people that are, going to, that are willing to just say, I'm just going to do what's right for righteousness sake, for the Lord's sake, because this is what God said. And hey, whatever the consequences are, they are. But if I'm going to follow Jesus, what were the consequences for him? He had to do what was right. And what's right was right, regardless of, of knowing that people are going to hate him and crucify him. And you know what? That might happen to us one day. But don't think, and, and it's a unique situation that we're in. Don't think that by backing down, things are going to get better for you. Because they won't. They won't. So when you get confronted in that crossroads of, of either backing down or standing firm on, on the Word of God, if you choose to back down, I'm not saying you're going to be destroyed like, like what would have, you know, could have happened to Esther, but I am saying that you will regret that decision and you will not, and, and things will turn out worse for you as a result of not making that sin. In, in whatever way that plays out specifically in, in each situation, it's never going to turn to good. But if you, if you do what's right, in the end, it will end up doing so much more good. And not just for you personally by earning rewards, but I mean even in the shorter term of the other people that you might not even be considering or thinking about because you're so focused on the repercussions against you, the other people that will be impacted by your stand, by what you do. And who knows how far that can go. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the great examples of faithful people in Scripture. God, we know that that all of these people are just, they're just human beings. They're creation. They're, they've been created by you as we were. And, and that, that we are, are you know, men of like passions like we, like we read about with, um, with Elijah and with, with, um, you know, not, with him praying that it wouldn't rain upon the earth and didn't rain for three and a half years. That, that we're men of like passions like him, Lord. That, that we're just people too. And, and we're nobody. But you've used a lot of nobodies in the past to do great things. And, and uh, I pray that you would please just help us to be strong in our faith and to be bold and to make the stands that are necessary, Lord, and that you would just, um, just help us and guide us and lead us. And I pray that you would please just um, work through your people and, and, Lord, that there'd be a lot more people willing to stand as we enter into the last days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.